to start launch right in with a conversation about hybrid. I am curious, and maybe we can get to this at the end when we talk about uh, who's on the webinar. Basically, if you're a publisher or if you're an author, um, I think Authors Guild is going to attract more authors, but I also think that some people are interested in this space as entering into it from a publishing perspective. So I try to address both sides, although this is more geared toward authors. So what you need to know about book publishing's newest business model is what we're going to be addressing today. And this is an exciting space in book publishing. I think a lot of authors are curious about this space because it's emerging and because it's new uh, and still being defined. And I'm going to talk about some progress that I know that's being made on that front. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, I have this little hybrid publishers <laughs> unite banner here. This is part of a Facebook group that I run because, in part, because I'm trying to find out who are we, who comprises this landscape, and I think one of the things that. Uh, some authors and publishers alike struggle with is just to figure out who are the hybrid publishers and not all hybrid publishers are defining themselves as hybrid publishers and so I'll, I'll address that as well. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of who I am. Uh, I think there's some familiar people who are familiar with me out there but certainly not everyone and so I uh, come out of traditional publishing. I was uh, spent 13 years in traditional publishing, including eight as the executive editor at Seal Press. And Seal Press uh, was a very independent women's press that was acquired twice. Uh, well, actually three times. Uh, and so now it happens to be under the Hachette imprint, making it interestingly part of the big five. But I left before it was acquired by Hachette uh, about five and a half years ago to start She Writes Press. And so I co-founded She Writes Press in 2012. We merged with another company and I inherited Spark Press in 2014. So I'm now the publisher of both of these imprints, both imprints we call hybrid presses. And I'll talk more about what that is and what that means in just a second. Uh, I'm also the board member um, I am a board member of the IBPA, which is the Independent Book Publishers Association, and I think it's important to address the IBPA on this call, in part because they have a good collaborative relationship with the Authors Guild, but also because a lot of the work that I'm doing around hybrid publishing is in the capacity of being the advocacy chair for the IBPA. And my role as the advocacy chair is taking on advocacy issues that affect authors and publishers alike. Uh, and one of the things that we're pushing to do right now, which is ma makes this webinar very timely, is to establish criteria for hybrid publishing. Because it is a space, like I said, it's still being defined. And I think in establishing some criteria, we're going to both figure out who the hybrid publishers are and also if people are not quite up to the standards of the criteria, hopefully they can shift their models just a little bit to fit within the, um, the nexus of, of what hybrid publishing is or, or what we're defining it to be uh, or what the IBPA is defining it to be. And finally, I'm the author of a few books, uh, which were mentioned in the introduction, so thank you for that. But importantly, these two industry books, Greenlight Your Book in particular, which talks quite a bit about hybrid publishing, why I founded She Writes Press, what the motivation was there, and why I think hybrid is an important and emerging space in the publishing industry. Uh, and I am certainly happy to get into some of that. And I think my... Uh, demonstration today in part includes that just because I am describing what I think hybrid is, um, you know, in light of where I am five years after having founded a, a hybrid press. So what is a hybrid publisher? Uh, it's a new publishing space. There are a lot of emerging models within hybrid and it's one of the things that makes it complicated. It's not self-publishing, but it's also not traditional publishing. And um, the reason it's not self-publishing, even though authors do pay to publish, is because the hybrid publisher takes on the role of a publisher, meaning that it's doing all these things for authors that very much look like a traditional publisher or feel like a traditional publisher. Uh, these things include curating, vetting submissions, uh, you know, making sure that the list makes sense and that you're not just publishing anything. Um, 
I've never been a particularly fond of the of the term vanity press in part because it is intentionally derogatory. But the reason that vanity exists as a term that gets lobbed about in a way that is, uh, you know, not so um, flattering for authors is because they do publish just anything. And so a hybrid publisher is explicitly positioning itself as a press that doesn't publish any just anything and has high editorial standards and some sort of curation process, a vetting process, so that uh, what is going on their lists is editorially sound and essentially approved by the publisher or some sort of editorial team. Uh, the other thing uh, that makes it not like self-publishing is that it has some form of distribution. It doesn't, a hybrid publisher may have traditional distribution, which is what we have, which makes us more like a traditional press than a lot of other hybrid presses. But hybrid presses may also have um, what I call active distribution, which means that it has mechanisms for getting the books into the marketplace beyond simply putting the book up for sale. Because anyone can put their book up for sale, but it's the mechanisms of putting it out on multiple platforms, you know, not just create space, but also Ingram, getting it into Ingram's catalog, opting into extended distribution, doing some sort of publicity and marketing plan. Even if the publisher doesn't take that on themselves, they should be supporting their authors to think through the ramifications of marketing and publicity. And because distribution and marketing and publicity work in tandem, you know, they're kind of a, a mosaic and they're all important together, a hybrid publisher should be at the very bare minimum educating its authors about how all of that works and having some sort of conversations with them about the plan for the book, where the book is going, so that there is an emphasis on sales and not simply oh, this is your legacy book and we're gonna put it up for sale and see what happens. You know, ideally there would be a bit more of a plan behind it than that. Uh, the way in which hybrid publishing is more like self-publishing and the thing that puts it in this gray space is that um, authors do pay to publish. So because you're paying to publish, this is the other space where it gets into the, the territory where people start to lob the vanity uh, insult, and I'll talk about that a bit more in this um, in this webinar. But the author pays. Uh, that said, they get a much higher percentage of royalties, and that's an important feature of hybrid. Yes, you're investing in yourself as an author, and therefore the press needs to give you higher royalties. And if they don't, then that's a, a red flag. You want to be really looking at those contracts. And we've established, or I've established, we've established at IBPA that most of the hybrid publishers in this space are offering at least 50%, if not higher, uh, net royalties. So it's something that you wanna be looking out for and making sure that you're advocating for yourself because it's a non-traditional deal. Um, and, and every press is gonna set this up differently. And you may not know what you're looking for exactly or necessarily what you're even looking at. Uh, and I think a lot of authors understandably get a little confused about what is even going on in this space and what are hybrid publishers. And so this webinar is an attempt to establish what hybrid publishing is um, and, and other things that I'll get to in just a second. So I, I want to, or I, I guess I should say I would be remiss not to bring up hybrid author as a term because hybrid author gets lobbed about all the time. People oftentimes who publish on a hybrid press then call themselves a hybrid author. This is incredibly confusing because a hybrid author in the industry is sort of an established term that means that you publish traditionally and you self-publish. Or maybe you have published on a hybrid press and traditionally or any combination of publishing. It simply means that you have published in more than one way. Uh, and we have to tease these out. People have said to me, you need to think of a different term for hybrid publishing. The problem is that once the industry adopts a term, it can be very difficult to say, well, that's not who we are. That's not what we're doing. Um, that said, I think there are plenty of hybrid publishers out there who are calling themselves other things. I've heard the terms entrepreneurial publisher, co-publisher, partnership publisher, mentor publisher, uh, and because we don't have an established term that everyone feels 100% about, 
this is going to continue to be a gray zone for authors as they're figuring out if someone, if a press doesn't uh, qualify or define themselves as a hybrid, but they look like a hybrid, it may be that ultimately the terminology doesn't matter that much. But what matters is that their practices make sense to you as an author. And what you're looking at is somewhere between traditional and self-publishing and that as an author, you feel that you know what you're paying for you're getting back something you're sharing the risk and so you're entering into an enterprise it's a shared risk it's something the the publisher is bringing to the table all of these services of um design cover design interior design and and ideally some sort of uh marketing publicity plan or education and perhaps uh the distribution relationship as well uh, so I just simply bring this up to say this is confusing for people and I know that so uh, If you've heard the term hybrid author and you thought well, that's a hybrid published author it, It's good in your mind to try to separate them as I said these two are often confused but have absolutely nothing to do with one another so what authors and aspiring authors need to know about hybrid, again, in my opinion, not all companies are equal. So do your due diligence. This is an important one. There are a lot of companies right now that are, I say, passing themselves off as hybrid. And the reason for that is because hybrid has begun to be embraced by the traditional industry. There have been write-ups in Publishers Weekly. The Authors Guild is hosting a webinar about this topic. There have been lots and lots of people writing in the space about hybrid publishing, myself included. Uh, Jane Friedman has a popular post about hybrid. Uh, a lot of people find us as a result of that post because she's an industry watcher who, who says smart things about publishing. Um, and so you need to be careful that you actually are signing with a hybrid. Uh, the way that you know is that uh, they're, well, the, it, it, that's what's hard. The way that you know right now is that you don't. You kind of are like, well, I think this is a hybrid press because they call themselves a hybrid press. Uh, but the work that I'm doing at the Independent Book Publishers Association right now with my team of amazing advocacy committee members is to define what this space is. And, you know, again, these, these basic things that I mentioned around vetting, some form of active distribution, uh, that the publisher have a bit of a mission or a sensibility to them, that they don't just publish anything, that uh, presses are meant to have a personality. They're meant to publish certain kinds of work. And the reason that publishers do that is because they have salespeople who are thinking about positioning their work into the marketplace. And if you take on any kind of book that has like almost no parameters whatsoever, no defining cohesive thing that pulls them all together, you can kind of dilute your message a little bit out in the world. And so that's one of the reasons that it's important, I think, that hybrid presses, like traditional presses, have a bit of a personality or a mission uh, or a message behind them that they are, are sticking to. Uh, and it, it does help you as an author, because what that means is that booksellers and other places will say, oh, okay, I recognize that press because it's doing this kind of work. They're known for X, Y, or Z. I mean, that could be very niche or it could be really broad, but there still should be some effort behind that. Uh, so you want to just take a look and see what the different offerings are that hybrid presses have um, and check with the IBPA in the months to come. I think within Hopefully, the month of February, we're going to be putting out um, the hybrid criteria. And I think, if, you know, particularly if you're an author, especially if you're a publisher who's interested in, in figuring out this space, that's going to be something that will be exciting to track because it will also help you be able to quantify or qualify who these hybrids are. And I think that's going to be a valuable service to authors because, unfortunately, in this industry, and there are a lot of predators or people taking advantage of authors all the time. And for those of us who really care about authors and are author advocates, the Authors Guild included, I mean, it's one of the reasons they exist. Uh, we're trying to steer people in the right direction and to prevent authors from succumbing to some of these places that don't necessarily have the author's best interest at heart. And, and I think that's where criteria really matter and, and why criteria and these definitions ultimately serve authors and, and why it's ultimately an advocacy issue. 
So who are the hybrid players? I mean, there's so many more than this, but I just put this little list together to show you that there are a lot out there. If you are a hybrid publisher on the list and you're not, uh, or uh, listening to me right now and you're not on this list, please email me. Let me know who you are. One of the most challenging things going on right now in, in this space is trying to figure out who the hybrid publishers are. I literally am probably the closest to anyone in this space trying to quantify uh, who the different hybrid publishers are, and I, I do not have a comprehensive list. So here are some of them. You know, She Writes, Spark Press are my own presses, of course. There's Torch Flame, Life Tree Media, Turning Stone, uh, Greenleaf, B. QB, Buffalo Heritage, Hybrid Global, Beavers Pond Press, and beyond. And, and we have a, a Facebook group. So if you are a hybrid publisher, uh, again, please get in touch with me on Facebook and I'll add you to the group. Or you can look for it on Facebook and, and I would be happy to add you. Because we are just uh, wanting to be a community that is setting standards and thinking this through for the sake of supporting authors. And if you're an author, it's beneficial to you as well, because eventually as we begin to piece this list together, you'll, you'll have a who's who. So some considerations for you if you are looking to publish on the hybrid press. Uh, hybrid publishing means publishing to traditional standards, and that is really important. You should be able to get your hands on some of the titles that the hybrid publisher that you're wanting to publish with has published, and it should be indistinguishable from a traditionally published book. You shouldn't look at it and feel like something is off. And even if you're an author and you're not an industry expert and you don't really know what you're looking for, you do know what a traditional published book looks like. I mean, we've all been reading for our whole lives. And so just on a gut level, if you see something that the design doesn't quite look as um, professional as you want it to be, or if you say to yourself, oh yeah, that looks self-published, you want to listen to those instincts. You know, there's a reason that books look self-published and it, it's again, you know, I, it's a criticism. It's not that I am anti-self-publishing. I'm actually very much pro self-publishing, but I'm pro self-publishing to traditional standards. And therefore I am pro hybrid publishing to traditional standards, which means that you should look at any self-published or hybrid book and not be able to tell the difference. And I spend a, quite a lot of time in my book, Greenlight Your Book, talking about just how, that and how important it is. Uh, hybrid publishers follow a set of criteria. I already said all of this, so I, you know, but it bears repeating just that these are considerations. If you are looking to uh, publish on a hybrid press, you should be able to ask them about printing and uh, publicity and marketing and distribution and get really good answers that you feel like make sense and that are transparent. And if you can get those things and you understand the royalty rates and they're giving you the information that you need and you feel good about that, then that may well be a perfect match for you. So just look at these things, talk to other authors. I say here in point three to demand transparency, ask for costs beyond what the company is offering with its publishing package there could be hidden costs and you want to be really careful about that. You don't want to have your book on the verge of coming out and then get slapped with some fee that you feel like comes out of nowhere. Um, I, I feel like the lack of transparency, unfortunately, is one of the worst parts of this industry and it and partly to do with what I said, because there are some predatory companies out there that enter into the space specifically to uh, take advantage of authors, but there's a lack of transparency that comes from traditional public Publishing. It's kind of always been a not very transparent industry. And so as to advocate for yourself, you can ask these questions and make sure you're getting a very clear answer to all of your questions. It can be hard to know what to ask for, what you're looking for. But again, that's why places like the Authors Guild exist to uh, look at contracts and to help you see what you might not be seeing. So make sure to do your due diligence. Again, talk to other authors who have published. If the hybrid publisher won't give you uh, recommendations or um, references rather, then I would say that would be a big red flag for me. You want to be able to have those conversations and to connect with people and to feel good about this thing that you're entering into because it's a major financial commitment. It's a time, money, energy commitment, and, and you should feel good and you should feel like you're going in with your eyes wide open. Uh, and, and my fourth point here, despite hybrids publishing, 
hybrid publishing's increasing visibility, authors still face the stigma of being author subsidized. And this is just a real thing. Uh, she writes Press and Spark Press. I feel like we are slowly overcoming it, but I am all about <laughs> being real with authors about what to expect. Uh, and you need to be able to ask these questions. One of the things that we have fought really hard for is to be recognized as a legitimate player to get traditional reviews. And we have won a lot of those battles. But you need to be able to ask the hybrid company that you're publishing with, do you qualify for traditional reviews? What does that look like? Make sure that you know what stigma still exists. And hopefully that will change. I mean, I've seen such a sea change in the last five years, but it's not over. And, and the industry is very set in its ways. And so this rising tide of hybrid publishing makes it uncomfortable and it's adjusting little by little. Uh, but you know, your, your job, it, should you choose to be a hybrid published author, is to really be an ambassador for other authors and to make sure that you're getting the best publishing deal that you can get, sort of the notion that you know, a, a rising tide floats all boats. And I feel that hybrid and self-publishing uh, are contributing to the potential of the rising tide and really allowing authors in general to be legitimized across the industry. And it's something that I'm really invested in and why I think that standards matter so much. So best practices to consider for all of you. Make sure you're fully ready before you go this route. I mean, do not be like, oh, I'm still shopping to an agent. Uh, you know, I still really, really, really want to be traditionally published, but I'll just do this just because. That is not a good idea. You will set yourself up for regret if you do that. Again, I said it's a lot of time, money, and energy. You want to make sure that you're ready and that you're not going to look back. It doesn't mean that your next book can't be traditionally published. In fact, I think that if you do a hybrid publishing route, the likelihood that your second book would be traditionally published is actually higher than just going out with nothing behind you uh, to support your efforts. So the, the publishing industry, I think, increasingly is seeing people taking a risk on themselves, investing in themselves, believing in themselves, and doing their first effort hybrid or self-publishing. And then the second effort can, not often, because it's still super, super competitive, but it can be that the second effort is traditionally published, particularly if you do everything right the first time around with hybrid or self-publishing. Um, read up on what the different hybrid models offer to see if one over another feels like a good fit. Again, you should be able to look at the website, feel like, yeah, I belong here. These are my people. Uh, maybe you can't talk to the publisher in every single instance, but you should be able to talk to someone high up. You should be able to have a one-on-one -on -one with someone in that company. And if you don't, and if you feel like you have reached a call center or someone is not answering your questions in a sane way, then move on. You know, you want to have, like I said, presses have a personality and you should feel like those are the people that you want to hang out with. You know, like this is your tribe. And, and that's really, really important because you're going to have a long relationship with these people. And so you want to, the trust really does matter. Uh, you know, and again, because people are taking advantage of authors, the trust thing, like I, I have so many authors who come to me and say, yeah, I had a bad feeling from the get go. And so, well, if you had a bad feeling, why did you do it? So trust your feelings, you know, you know, if it's going to work out or, I mean, it's not work out. It's not a good way to um, frame it, but you, you can tell if you have that eh, uneasiness that that just is going to be a recipe for problems down the road. Uh, come having considered your publicity agenda and ideas, uh, say since hybrid companies have zero to minimal publicity built into their contracts. So that's an important one. I was saying earlier that a hybrid publisher should be able to talk to you about publicity and marketing. Some may have publicity and marketing built into their contracts because I don't know the inside outs of all the contracts that are out there. But our contracts, for instance, and our, our publishing plan do not include publicity. Publicity is a, is a secondary 
thing that, uh, that we encourage authors to do. So as a result of that, we really encourage people to think about publicity uh, and to hire publicists. And we're very upfront about that just in terms of educating authors. Again, my press may be different from other presses, but you don't wanna go into this venture just with your eyes shut around publicity because publicity is going to be the engine that drives the sales uh and so if you know if you don't have a big uh too big a, a plan or or goals around publishing like you don't really care if you sell a few hundred books because it's not that sales is not really the biggest agenda then the publicity may be secondary but if you do and you really want to get out there in a big way and you're publishing for the sake of putting yourself out in a big way, then you, you need to have this conversation and, and these thought processes around pub, uh, publicity. Finally, the better educated you are about publishing and the hybrid experience, the better success you'll have post-publication. I mean, this is best practice for any author, uh, self-publishing, hybrid publishing, or traditional publishing. So kudos to all of you for being here. So where are we going from here? Uh, most important, I think, is the defining this criteria uh, that, that the IBPA is hard at work on, that the Authors Guild has already supported. So we're very excited about that. Again, this is so timely. It's happening right now. Um, this is going to support authors to make good decisions when choosing a hybrid publisher. And so uh, this is something that if you're following IBPA or following Authors Guild, you should see in the month to come um, as we put out some information about it. And especially if you're an aspiring author and you're looking to choose a hybrid publisher, I would say that these criteria will help you choose because you'll be able to say to a hybrid publisher, do you do all of these things? And there are nine things on the list. Um, and, and if the answer is yes to all of them, then you can at least rest assured that it is a legitimate hybrid publisher. Then you still have to do all the other due diligence that I mentioned of getting the references, talking to people, ordering the books, you know, really make sure that you order a handful of books, I would say to get five or six of that publisher's books and hold them in your hands and open them and look at the pages and look at the covers. It matters a lot. Um, Authors who publish on hybrid presses are ambassadors for this model. I believe this to be true. You know, I, I really see from my own experience that authors who are publishing on hybrid presses are really happy with their experiences in large part because they are getting such a professional product uh, and a, an experience that parallels traditional publishing when traditional publishing is closed off to authors for what I believe to be very complicated reasons. Uh, as I say often and have talked about quite a lot, uh, you know, traditional publishing is not rejecting authors because they don't have good books. They're rejecting authors because they maybe recently published a book that was similar to yours, because you don't have a big enough author platform, because they don't think that they're going to be able to sell enough copies of your book to merit the kinds of advances they have to pay. And so if you can really consider the why of a traditional publisher saying no, it, the hybrid option opens up a tremendous amount of possibility and it's exciting because it's kind of saying to traditional, like my goals are different. You know, I don't have to necessarily sell 10,000. I don't have to necessarily get an advance. I can go out there and I can do this and I can do it professionally and I can have opportunities. Uh, authors who get to who go this route get to be decision makers too, helping to shape the future of this space. I mean, I highly believe this to be true. Uh, I think that this is where this is also an in between space. Yes, publishers are establishing themselves as hybrid publishers, but it's the authors who are saying, "Look, we want this level of professionalism. We want this level of legitimacy." we're choosing to get our books out in this way and it's the authors who are shaping it and, you know yes the publishers are the vehicle uh, and it's the good publishers who are listening to their authors and and making this whole experience be more author friendly i mean i, I certainly believe for myself that um, hybrid and self-publishing is more author friendly because the traditional space it you know it has lots of good aspects to it but it's not always author friendly because of the lack of transparency that I mentioned earlier uh, and because you know sometimes decisions are being made that you don't really get to weigh in on um, and you know I think that's increasingly becoming the case uh, 
Point number four here, ongoing legitimacy in the marketplace stems from high editorial quality, great covers, and building a strong track record. I mean, this goes without saying, but where are we going from here? We're going toward legitimacy. I think that we can, in certainly in my lifetime, I hope to see a space in which hybrid is completely legitimized, you know, where that some of this remaining stigma is completely gone. And I, I think we are marching toward that in a steady and, and sure way. And finally, we can anticipate more players entering this space. Uh, and I think that's more authors, it's more publishers. And that, that means be careful. <laughs> because as people are like, oh, this is great, then you have these predators and these insincere business models. And, and those people are the ones that scare me the most because I, I think um, th this is an important thing that you're trusting people with. Your book is an extension of you. It is really like your persona out in the world. And I can't say enough how much it matters that you feel good about the partnership that you're having with um, whomever you're going to move forward with. So, so do be careful. Expect the gold standard. I just put some of our covers on here. I think everyone can agree that they're gorgeous. <laughs> we have an amazing editorial director and team, and we get a lot of feedback that our covers are beautiful. And yes, books get judged by their covers. I know absolutely that our program is judged by our covers. And if you think that's not true, it's time to reboot and reset your expectations. This is probably one of the most important things uh, that you can do is make sure that you look at the covers. And it's not just the covers, it's also the interior designs. Um, again, you can look at a traditionally published book, grab a book from Random House or Penguin, um, and grab uh, the book from the hybrid publisher that you want to publish with and open them side by side and look to see if there's anything wonky about the hybrid publishers um, settings that you just feel like that you don't like as much you know you want to be a, you don't have to be a, a design expert but you should know what a traditionally published book looks like and your book um, you know you should have the expectation that your book would meet those standards absolutely to settle for anything less just in my opinion doesn't make sense this is an IBPA meme that I love, level the reading field, uh, and I stand by this very much, just believe that we need to level the reading field, that it doesn't matter how you get published, it matters how you publish. So your path to publishing is less important than that you publish well. Uh, and that certainly is true for self-publishing and hybrid publishing, as I've been saying all along. You can have a gorgeous book that you can be proud of that can sell like hotcakes uh, if you adhere to the standards that, uh, that traditional publishing has. And, and that is something that is absolutely attainable. And so the IBPA has this standards checklist that is here in this little URL if you wanna copy it down go grab the standards checklist and then you can know for yourself what the standards are and they're pretty straightforward they're pretty technical you know we're not asking people to jump through major hoops we're just simply saying there is a long standing tradition of book publishing out there it's been around for many many decades and um and no matter your publishing path, you should be able to check off all of the uh, boxes on the standards checklist. And then you can know that at least you have a technically uh, well put together book. We, we cannot speak to the editorial quality. <laughs> for that, you will have to hire an editor. All right, so thank you all for listening to me and my, the, the presentation part is over and I am very excited to hear your questions. And uh, I put all my URLs and um, social media stuff on here. I'd love to connect. And especially if you're listening now and you follow me today, I'll, I'll follow you back and we can exchange uh, topics. We can, we can talk about hybrid online. Excellent. So we will start uh, answering some questions now. So you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for those of you that are watching on Zoom right now. Um, and if we do have time, then we can probably uh, jump to some of the um, Facebook questions as well. Um, so you can just comment if you're on Facebook and we will see it. So let's see here. Um, Emily asks, let's see, this last question. Um, do you need an agent to approach a hybrid press or is there any reason to use one? 
So definitely you don't need an agent and, and certain agents may be reluctant because obviously you're paying and therefore they're not getting their commission. Uh, but that said, many of our authors do use agents and the way that that usually works is that they will come up with some sort of agreement with their agent where the agent still gets their 15%, but it's after the author earns out. So we actually have a handful of agents who have done pretty well because the authors have earned out all of their expenses and then the royalty checks um, beyond their expenses are, are being split 85-15, which is industry standard with their agents. I would say about 10 to 12 of our books are agented. Uh, but it's usually the authors who bring their agents along. Uh, you know, it's the authors who say, I'm ready for this. You know, we tried traditionally, it didn't work. And, and then usually the agents are on board because they want their author to have an, a, a chance at success. Um, but some agents, you know, just simply won't be open to it. So you, you'll have to, you know, walk that line with, with them as individuals. Sorry. Um. Sylvia asks, who retains the rights to the book, author or publisher? The author in our case. I, certainly, I can't speak to every single publishing contract, but in our case, the author retains their rights, and it's explicit and detailed in the contract. So you want to look at the contract and see how that's written, uh, see which rights are retained. I mean, just like a traditional publisher with our contracts and with many hybrid publishers that I know, you negotiate your rights. You know, so many authors choose to keep derivative, they choose to keep audio, they choose to keep uh, foreign, you know, th there's any number of negotiable points within, but um, I would say that you could advocate for, for holding on to your rights if, if the contract didn't state that. Um, then the next question is from Tony, who would just like to know how they can reach you. Um, should they, you know, yeah, on my Facebook, I mean, any one of these uh, online spaces, if you want to email me, um, my, my URL there, the Brooke Warner has a contact page. Okay, excellent. And uh, Tony, I also want to let you know that uh, you were looking for hybrid publishers and uh, they have one, Word Keepers Inc. is Tony's. Uh, Thank you. Page. I will make a note, but I also welcome you uh, emailing me, Tony, because I'm going to write it down on a scrap of paper. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark asks, university presses sometimes ask for subventions, especially for books with a small or uncertain market or with significant production costs. Are there, are any university presses actively operating at least partly as hybrid publishers? They probably don't allow, allow high royalty rates and they understandably insist on reliable right. vetting, but can deals be arranged for academic authors who want to front many of the publication costs. I'm wary of for-profit, oh, I just lost it, for-profit commercial academic publishers who apparently charge for betting. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I happen to know people at University of California Press who have told me that they're moving into experimenting with hybrid models. I don't know if they would call it that. So you have to be careful about your language. You know, don't get into jargon with it. It doesn't matter what it's called. Um, but this kind of, uh, I guess, basically subsidizing some of the costs in exchange for X, Y, or Z. I mean, I, you know, I, I tell this story, I, I did a TEDx talk, and so my, my story is out there, but this whole model came about for me because when I was uh, uh, very first in publishing back in 2000, the publisher that I worked for was a traditional press that did hybrid deals. We called it co-publishing. And so these kinds of deals exist in the marketplace in many, many different capacities. And many publishers are open to co-publishing and hybrid deals. And they're not, uh, you know, calling themselves hybrid presses. So I feel like a good business person and you have a good book, yeah, if you're willing to share the risk, then the likelihood that you would get published with them is, is higher than if you were not willing to share the risk. So I think being entrepreneurial minded and, and pitching yourself in that way, if you can get in touch with the decision maker at that press, um, there, I, there's no reason to not try. And, and I know for a fact that certain university presses are open to it. What? 
And uh, next question, can you talk about hybrid publishers submitting their books for awards, recognition for authors in a global literary community? Yeah, I mean, it just varies a lot. So we, <laughs> you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to legitimize hybrid. Uh, and, and I think that myself and other hybrid publishers in this space have done a really good job. And so it's just interesting because there are some awards programs that are like, I love it. It's so creative. You're totally in. And there are others who say, no way your author subsidized, you know, we will not consider you. And I am keeping an ongoing list of, you know, the open versus closed submissions for awards. Um, within the local literary community. I mean, again, I think it totally depends on the space. You know, I recently I've just found all of our authors are allowed into all literary festivals. It just it hasn't been a problem. But there are grants that they don't that they can't qualify for. So that language that you see that is author subsidized, that's like the new um, the new term that you'll see where it says, you know, if, if your work is author subsidized, you don't qualify. And, and I welcome anyone here to share with me, you know, places that are not allowing you in because that's another thing I'm interested in just as information. Um, we are trying to change that, but you, you will face, you know, certainly you'll face that out in the world, but it's getting better and better. Um, let's see, looking through questions in those places. Um, <laughs> My hybrid cannot create the design I want for front cover. They use Photoshop. It was almost comical. How do I hold them responsible for getting the right book cover when they only give three choices and two edits? Well, I, I mean, I, I would just suggest that you go back to them and say, you know, I listened to this webinar. I'm not happy with my cover. You know, this is the reason why I feel like it's not adhering to industry standards and you know, you could certainly take it so far as to say that you want to outsource the cover. Um, if, you know, I don't know how that will go down. Um, you know, we, we, for instance, are keep a pretty tight lock on our cover design in part because our, our point is like, this is our brand and we know what we're doing and our covers speak to the fact that we know what we're doing. Um, so if you're super unhappy, it, it could come down to it being a deal breaker, but I would certainly say, uh, I really want to outsource this. You would have to pay for it probably, but, but the publisher may say they're willing. Um, you might have to have like a mutual agreement to be happy with your final cover, but I would say do not publish if you're really dissatisfied with your cover. You know, if it's that bad that you are calling it comical, don't move ahead. You know, the worst case scenario is that you have to pull out of your contract, but you don't want to have something that you're embarrassed with a year from now, two years from now. I mean, these things live on forever. And as I said, it's an extension of you. So I, I encourage you to just have a real straightforward conversation with your publisher. And uh, next question is, are authors supposed to pay, um, I'm sorry, I keep losing these when people miss, are authors supposed to pay for printing? And if so, how do you control those costs? In our, again, I can only speak for my own presses. The authors do pay for printing uh, and we give them manufacturing costs, you know. So the benefit then is that authors pay manufacturing costs, which is like two to three dollars per book. Uh, and they have different opportunities. I mean, we handle the, the, the trade market, you know, so all retailers, for instance. But what having your book at manufacturing costs allows is that if you want to sell to corporations or if you got, you know, a, a big sale, for instance, I mean, I, with my own book, I've had a few opportunities to sell like a hundred copies. And so if my book costs $3 per unit, but I'm charging, you know, $10 per copy, I'm making $7 per book on those sales. And that's, pretty amazingly good for book publishing. <laughs> you know, we're talking about such small margins in this industry. Uh, so that's, that's how we handle it. You know, we, and we encourage authors to direct sell, but we have an exclusive relationship to the trade. Uh, and we price out the books for authors. We help them consider uh, what their print runs should be. So this is a very transparent conversation that I have with authors along the way, but it's, you know, that's a great question. For instance, when I talked about hidden fees, you know, if it's not explicitly stated, 
uh, with a hybrid publisher, you want to ask them about that because it's an expense. You know, printing is not cheap. Um, Miriam uh, asked if we at the Authors Guild will review a contract from a hybrid press, and Miriam B answered that as yes, we will. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have lots of our authors getting reviewed by Authors Guild. Actually, <laughs> we, we do review some of uh, yeah. those from She Writes. Um, how receptive are hybrid publishers to putting back into print books that were published previously but are now out of print? Again, obviously, that's going to depend on the publisher from publisher to publisher. We are receptive to it, and we have done second editions. I I usually tried to dissuade people from doing that in general. If your book, like if you just published your book in the last year or two, and the only reason you're redoing it is because you feel like you didn't do a good, a good enough job, I, I feel like you're probably better served by writing your next book. Um, the reason being because if you have basically, um, you know, reached out to all of your contacts, everybody knew, knows that you published a book, you know, your closest friends and family already came to your launch party, and then you're like, oh, well, I'll just do it through, tr through She Writes Press because they're, um, you know, they have distribution. It's not that you can't do that. I just, I, I, I feel like it's not the best use of people's time, money, and energy, which I was talking about before. Um, and in certain cases, it is merited. But the best case scenario is that you have a 10-year-old book. You know, it's, it's old. Uh, you you want to repackage it. You want to put it out as a second edition. Maybe you're going to put a new introduction or a new conclusion, or it has, you know, 10% new content, and you're going to call it a second edition with a new ISBN, a new publisher, in those cases, it makes a lot of sense. So it's, you know, super case by case basis. Um, and I don't want to dissuade anyone, but I also am not interested in seeing people, you know, just spend a whole lot of money. And then basically, the book doesn't go that much farther than the original edition. Um, there are several questions, so I'll kind of lump these together. Um, is there a can you share a ballpark figure an author can expect to pay a hybrid publisher to have his or her book published? And what can authors expect to get for that money? I mean, <laughs> ballpark in this space is very, very hard because I know some hybrid publishers that are charging as little as, I, I think the cheapest hybrid publisher I personally know of, their publishing package is 1500 The most expensive I think uh, is maybe Greenleaf or Turning Stone. I, I believe that their publishing packages might be nine to 10,000. And we're right in between that. Ours currently sits at 5,900. Um, you need to go onto the website and see what that includes. You know, in our case, it's a long list and I'm not gonna rattle off all the various things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the expectation is of what it includes, obviously. I mean, some of the reason why costs will vary is because you're getting more. The reason I think, I mean, we started out at 3,900 and the reason that we're now at 5,900 is because we discovered that we needed to spend a whole lot more time on proofreading, uh, you know, so like sort of an editorial quality control, which ends up being a light copy edit in a lot of cases. And we needed to spend a whole lot more money on covers. You know, we had like all these parameters around how much we're going to spend for covers and the covers weren't good enough you know they were not competing and now we spend regularly between 500 and a thousand of those dollars on a cover image alone and then in beyond that the cover design so you know sometimes 1500 to two thousand dollars of our package is going into the cover alone and you know yeah you can get a cover on fiverr for five bucks and that doesn't mean that that's the best cover. So you, you are looking to get what you pay for. Um, I guess related to that question, um, kind of Lisa asks, you mentioned shared risk. So is it true that a hybrid publisher invests a similar amount in the book, that it's not all the author's money? Not in our case. I mean, I don't think that is the case for hybrid. The, it, the shared risk is that you, I mean, this is how I think about it anyway. The shared risk is that you're on our brand, you know, and that She Writes Press has a, a risk of putting itself out there with its books um, and, and doing a good job in the relationships and the position that we have in the marketplace. Um, so in, in that sense, it matters to me and other publishers tremendously what we publish. 
Um, so to that extent, the risk is on the author. I guess that maybe that was a misnomer or, you know, could have been stated better, but um, on the tail end, the author gets uh, a much higher proceeds. You know, in our case, we give the author 60% of net. Um, and the reason that we keep 40 is because 30 to 35% of our 40 goes back to our distributor. Uh, so, you know, we're making like peanuts, you know, the, the 5% is pretty much also eaten up by um, shipping costs and fees from Ingram. But regardless, uh, I guess that's what I mean by, by shared and I'll, I'll think about how I qualify that moving forward. Um, are you aware of any type of rating services that rate agents or publishing companies? Um, so meaning how can an author determine if a potential agent or publisher is reliable and is following ethical standards? Yeah, you know, I, I think the best way to do that is, is just doing research. There, per my earlier comment, you can absolutely ask for references. Um, with regard to agents, I think that's the same thing. You can use Publishers Marketplace and you can see what deals these people are selling. You know, Publishers Marketplace is a good place to vet traditional agents and, and you can look at their sites. Um, I don't know. Do you know the answer to that? If there's like a, a vetting system, there is a site called editors and predators or something like that. But, um, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I'm getting that right. Um, and you know, if you are a member and you, and you have a contract, then obviously, right. you know, would review that contract for you and kind of give you some advice there. Right. And, you know, members can also always call us if, if there's someone that you are dealing with that you, you know, maybe we have some kind of input on that, that particular um, company. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, but that's something that we can look into on this side, too. Perfect. Um, that's helpful. You guys, if there's, you know, a way to kind of help vet some of these places. Um, let's see. How is the print run of a hybrid book determined as per she writes and spark press specifically and in general? Yeah, I mean, great question. Again, this is not going to be pertinent to necessarily every hybrid press that's out there. Because we have traditional distribution, our situation very much parallels a traditional press. So in a traditional publishing company, print runs are determined in large part on pre-orders. And so just like a traditional press, we also get pre-orders. And we have projections and pre-orders, and we have to print at least as many pre-orders as we get. And we normally print double the pre-orders, at least. We're trying to project out to have enough quantity to last us a year. Um, and that's pretty standard thinking in traditional publishing. And I share the numbers with our authors to help them determine the best print run for them. Some of them are more bullish. <laughs> uh, some of them are a little more conservative. And that depends on the author and all lot of stuff that they have going on but we basically use three things to determine print run one is pre-orders two is the publicity plan and confirmed publicity and number three is uh, events that the author may have lined up for themselves that they're going to be getting non-trade sales you know which means they're hosting their own launch party at a friend's house or they have a connection to an organization who's going to buy a hundred of their books and, and so we're taking all those factors into consideration Um, what about, uh, Marianne asked, what about willingness by reviewers to review hybrid published books? Right. I mean, to my earlier point, this is something that I have been fighting for, I would say, for the past five years, because I think it's so important that hybrid publishers are allowed to be traditionally reviewed. Um, and for us, and, and again, I don't know that this is the case for all publishers, uh, but we are allowed to be traditionally reviewed by every single trade outlet except Kirkus. They are the final holdout and um, I'm working on it, but I, <laughs> I, I would love for them to change their mind, but for the time being, they're digging in their heels. Um, Emily asked, do you allow authors to print in America or with a green press, recycled paper, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, allow, you know, for us, absolutely, it's a question of cost. And many authors say that they want to publish on post-recycle uh, paper, um, and, and that's awesome. Um, and we have connections with, um, with printers who do that. And so we have a number of authors. It, it usually really stems from the author 
desiring that um, in part because it costs more. So we would love it. I would love every single book on our list to be printed on, um, on recycled paper. But of course, it's the author's choice at the end of the day because it costs significantly more. I mean, I would say like on a print run of a thousand, you can probably, uh, a thousand books that is, you can probably anticipate that it's going to be an additional 500 beyond the estimate. Um, do hybrid publishers mostly use CreateSpace or do they um, do traditional manufacturing methods? That is going to, again, totally depend on the hybrid publisher. I do know that there are hybrid publishers who are using Ingram. Um, like, yes, they'll use CreateSpace, but no hybrid publisher can be like a really effective hybrid publisher if they're only using CreateSpace. The reason for that is because bookstores do not like Amazon and bookstores don't many bookstores don't take create space books. And so if they're not using Ingram, I would say that would be one of the qualifiers. They have to be using Ingram. Um, we uh, have Ingram as our traditional distributor, but they are also a wholesaler and lots of other things. Um, and yeah, so I think that's gonna vary from company to company, but I would make sure that they have some kind of relationship with Ingram and that it's not only create space. Um, what are typical prices for the books you publish? Our price point is pretty consistently $16.95 because of the kind of book that we publish, which is like mainly novels and memoirs, but we have other kinds of books on our list. We have a couple coffee table books, poetry books that are priced all over the place. You know, we have a book that is $40 because <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, photography book. We have a poetry book that's $12.95. Again, the hybrid publisher should be able to help you determine your price point based on industry you know it has i am very clear with my authors anyway that the price has to be industry competitive because if you overprice your book uh it's very possible that the bookstores just simply won't order it because it's not competitive with other with with your competitive titles um can hybrid um publishers publish children's picture books um, and another mm -hmm. question related can they do they publish ebooks so either of those things right so uh, hybrid publishers will publish whatever hybrid publishers publish uh, you know kind of depending on their own list that's the point i was making earlier about their their vision or their mission we don't publish children's books that's a choice uh, in part because of how expensive it is and in part because of how complicated that market is and i do not come out of uh, children's book publishing and therefore I don't feel I didn't feel that I could serve the authors uh, doing children's books there are other hybrid publishers however that would very much feel that they can serve their authors and or, and no children's publishing so you have to figure that out you have to find the right fit uh, in terms of ebooks I hope that hybrid publishers are doing ebooks simultaneously um, I don't know that I would say that's a requirement to be a hybrid press uh, it's, it's not on our criteria, but for us, uh, every single book we publish is, um, is published simultaneously as an ebook and a print book. And I think the reason we didn't make it a criteria is because we wouldn't want to bar someone saying like, in all other ways, you are a hybrid press, but because you're not doing ebooks, you're not, when some books shouldn't be ebooks. You know, I mean, I, I have an off, a friend, for instance, who's the publisher of like a, um, a Japanese art books you know they're like gorgeous they sell for over a hundred dollars and it just doesn't make sense for him to put those into ebooks um can those of us who are hybrid publishers participate with the input for a standardized list coming out from ibpa and the authors guild <clears throat> um I, I don't think you can participate with the input because we've already finalized it. Um, but you certainly can review it. And if you object, <laughs> uh, you can make your opinions known. Um, you know, I, I think as anything that is trying to be defined, it will be interesting to see how people react. We had an, you know, an advocacy committee of 10 publishers on this committee to put this list together. So uh, my, my you know, fingers crossed that people will find it good, but um, whoever you are, please join the hybrid publisher group on Facebook and or contact me and, um, you know, we, we are going to be very open to feedback. Um, could you talk a bit about uh, audiobook production and hybrid audiobook publishing? 
for audio, uh, there may be some hybrid publishers that have more of an audio program than we have. We don't. And so the way that we're getting audiobooks out is that we're working with third party audio um, people, you know, so we have audiobook companies that contact us because they're interested in buying the rights to our audio to our books. So we're our authors are getting it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not great money, but we're getting offers, you know, usually a 500 to a thousand dollars um for the product to for our authors to do audiobooks um and then lots of people who are not getting offers are doing their own audiobooks on acx which requires us to release the rights that's how we do it but um you know again that can vary from publisher to publisher um okay wait. Try to see can looks like that. we're we're probably coming on time too we might have to just like yeah. The rest of these we might have to answer um, by text for for you guys later. <laughs> we still have quite quite a few more questions to get through. Um, well, I I would suggest we take a couple more, and then I would to I'd be more than happy to answer these questions. You could put your questions on the Authors Guild Facebook page, and I will come in and answer them. Excellent. That's a a good way to do it. Um, let's see. Can you talk about the value of hardback publishing versus trade publishing versus electronic only? You know, um, it, it just, that's so much about what kind of book you have and what your goals are. Like for instance, E only to me makes sense in very limited contexts. Um, it, it can be something that is a smart thing to do to float an idea. I actually have an ebook, my, my book that's called How to Sell Your Memoir. Uh, just because it's a little bit about, it's not so much about selling the book as much as having the content in the world. Uh, so I think there are explicit reasons to do E only, but they're, they're specific. <laughs> um, in terms of hardcovers, I mean, uh, they, you know, they're expensive, they're expensive to produce and they're expensive to buy. And there's a reason why traditional publishers do hardcovers and it's a holdover in a lot of ways from another era. But a lot of times if the hardcover doesn't sell well, they strip and rebind it for the paperback. And so they have that tech, that capacity, you know, they'll put out the hardcover and then it, they try to sell a ton. And then a year later, if they still have inventory, they strip and rebind. Well, as hybrid publishers and, you know, if you're, or self publishers, many of us don't have that capacity. So we don't have a hard cover program. Um, authors who want that can do a hardcover print run and we will absolutely put it into um, circulation. Uh, but I think you just need to be really clear about why you're doing it and what your goals are. And if you're going to work with a hybrid publisher, you would just talk through, you know, what your options are. For us, it's an additional $500 just because it takes, you know, it's a whole other file. And, you know, there's a lot of considerations when you're doing um, these additional formats. Um. Uh, Miriam asks, if someone has an imprint now and goes with a hybrid publisher, is the imprint lost? Does the book say produced by hybrid press? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by imprint. Like if you're talking about your own imprint um, or, or something else. But yeah, like if you are currently published on, you know, whether it's a self-published situation or you have your own imprint or another imprint, if you go with a hybrid company and you republish your book, you would have to publish it republish it because like we won't pu we publish everything under our own isbns our own logos you know we won't just like take your book with your logo and your imprint on it and put it out into the world um you know in part because everything that we're doing is under the she writes umbrella right so that is where, where the, you know particularly with regard to branding and the isbn numbers so i'm, I'm not sure if i answered your question but I think with that, we'll probably need to wrap it up. But for everyone that is asking if this uh, video will be available later, um, if you want to go back and look at the presentation, it will be. Um, we are recording this and we will um, have it posted on the website shortly. Also, you can jump over to our Facebook page and the video should be there as well. So either place, you should be able to go ahead and watch this recording if you want to go back and catch up. Um, so thank you so much, Brooke, for joining us today. Thank you. And I will answer those questions. So put them in there. I just, I'm, I'm about to go to lunch. So check back in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. And thank Thanks. you. Brooke. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me.